lesson on biblical hermeneutics. What we'll be doing here today is looking at some unsound principles of interpreting information. And uh, we'll give a little review of what we've already covered. And we'll be looking at epistemology again, how we know things. And there's three ways that I believe we know things. We know by our senses that's empirical knowledge and science is based upon empirical knowledge. So that's what we're talking about science. And of course, scientific knowledge is tentative knowledge. Uh, we know by math and logic and mathematics is really just a, a branch of logic. But uh, math and logic depends upon the information you put into them. If you have a good, perfectly good equation, but you put wrong information in, you don't get a good answer. So again, we have a, uh, the mathematics and logic is still dependent upon what you put into the equation or put into the, the logical argument. Now, <clears throat> we have faith, Hebrews 11, 1, and following, as we have already defined it now. And if you're in the logic class, we define it in the logic class in some detail in the logic book. I think all of you are also in that logic class, so we have it in the book there in that in that book. Now, I'm going to apply some applications of some of these truths to hermeneutics. Now, we're not looking entirely at the Bible in this lesson. We're trying to see how fallible some of the other methods of knowing things is, how, how fallible these methods are. We're going to look at psychology and psychiatry first. We're going to look at examples from biological science and from physical science and, and examples from history. We'll be looking at all of these. <clears throat> the catharsis theory is that used to be taught by psychologists, psychologists and psychiatrists both. Psychiatrist is the one with an MD degree, and psychologist doesn't have a medical doctor degree. That's part of the difference. And uh, they actually the Schools of psychiatry and psychology are just a little different in their thinking and approach to things. Right? But the catharsis theory was encouraged both by psychiatrists and psychologists in the past. They called it venting. And if you are angry, you are supposed to vent. Also, we'll be looking at that in a little more detail. Homosexuality was once classified as deviant behavior by both psychiatrists and psychologists, but that has changed. We'll be looking at that and see what's implied by that. For years, psychologists told people to vent their anger and that, and that, and that this was healthy. And now, now psychologists have reversed their earlier contention that people should vent their anger. They've done psychological studies and found that it actually is counterproductive and it actually is not good for us. And what I'm using this to show is that psychologists and, and psychiatrists uh, have changed their mind about things. And so this shows that the scientific approach to these things what is unstable, it's not a safe guide. It changes from time to time. So we don't have any stability in it. And that's primarily what I'm trying to show here with this. Venting, several studies have revealed that the act of venting your anger creates a more deep-seated anger. It actually causes more problems in the thinking and in, in the mind of the person. There's a study done, at, and here's a website, and of course you can type this in. Oh, we won't go to it here, but you can, this was study done, and uh, it showed that it actually was counterproductive with it. That is, bending is not a good idea. And of course, we Christians know that already. We knew that 3,000 years ago. The children of Israel knew that. 
because it was revealed in the book of Proverbs written about uh, approximately 900 or 1000 BC. Proverbs 29, 11 and other passages. Proverbs says, a fool utters all his anger, but a wise man keepeth it back and stilleth it. So <clears throat> the psychologist and psychiatrist started out advising you to utter all your anger, but now they have done research on it, and good research probably, and found that it actually is bad to do that. But of course, we believers in the Bible knew that was bad all along. And so, because we believe Proverbs 29, 11. Venting causes more anger, and we see this in Proverbs 15, 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but a grievous word stirreth up anger. So now then what we see is the Bible all along has said that it wasn't a good idea to do that. Now, <clears throat> I suspect that there were people that were being told, well, look, your Bible says not, not to do that, but the psychiatrist and psychologist are telling us to do it, so your Bible must be wrong. No. I'm showing that the psychologists and psychiatrists are pretty fickle. Uh, they they change their mind. Now, if if they have true evidence, the evidence I believe will always be in harmony with what the Bible says. If the Bible is from God, and of course it is. Now, homosexuality in the past was listed and classified as deviant behavior until 1973 when the American Psychiatric Association voted to, to de quit calling it deviant and to call it normal behavior. In 1975, the American Psychological Association, that was two years later, they also voted to quit calling it deviant and began to call it normal behavior. Again, we see the change in the in the uh, direction of the these two psychological groups and psychiat psychiatrists and psychologists. And, and again, they claim that homosexual now is normal and well, they were formerly right, but now they're wrong, of course. The scriptures, of course, teach us that it is not normal. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile passions, for their women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men, even the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working on seamless and receiving in themselves the recompense of the error which was due. So here we see it's listed as a sin. Other passages show it as well, but we won't look at it in more detail. Verse 28 continues, and even as they refused to have God in the knowledge, God gave them up to a reprobate mind. That's a mind that can't be assayed or, or tested. And if it's tested, it comes out to be uh, not of, of good value. It's like it's a word that was used for assaying an ore. If you had a, an ore that you thought was gold and it was really iron pyrite, and that's called fool's gold, uh, that would be a reprobate. See, it's been assayed or checked out and it's and it's not genuine and to do those things which are not fitting. We're going to look at further one now, the uh, Ernst Heinrichs Heichel and I have here Michael Richardson and in March 2000 and then in, uh, in natural history and science and I don't have the page numbers, I lost them. I'm going to get them again and put them in here in my notes with Stephen Jay Gould. And this was in 1997. I got to get into a library and look at it, but but uh, where I can access these books, uh, these journals. But what we have here, uh, they discuss the falsification of these drawings. Now, why is this important? Well, the drawings are still being used in biology books, and yet they were believed and understood to be falsified. 
So they were falsified drawings. They were not genuine. And so it was all based upon a falsification of, of the data. And, and Heichel was charged with this, even if the drawings, however, were proper, wouldn't necessarily prove the conclusion that organic macroevolution has occurred. This similarity could have been because the creator designed these organisms with the best design possible. So again, the claim was made, this proves that organic evolution occurred, and uh, it really doesn't. Here's Eichel, and he was born in 1834 and died in 1919. Eichel's argument is this, this is kind of a summary of it. If organic microevolution occurred, then the embryo should go through the same process as evolution. And uh, so he argued this. This is called the embryonic recapitulation theory that should be true. So he argues then that the embryonic recapitulation theory is true, and that's supposedly proven by his drawings. And then, of course, he then claims organic macroevolution has occurred. Now, all of you are in the logic course, but we haven't gotten to conditional syllogisms yet. But this contains a fallacy, a logical fallacy, which we'll see later. It's called affirming the consequence. It proves absolutely nothing. And so logically, it doesn't prove what they claim it's proving. And so that's their basic argument. Now, we can come back to that after you've studied it in logic. It's in chapter six of our logic book. Heichel was charged with falsifying the drawings. At least there are a number of people that claim that he was, and these are not theists that are making this claim. These are atheists. And there are various authorities have debated whether or not Heichel was actually charged with fraud, however. So there's a discussion about it. Some say he was, some say he wasn't. But many atheists argue that he didn't falsify any of his drawings. <laughs> At least some atheists do. Here was his drawings. And uh, what, he, what he claims is, when you look at it, that the embryo has a tail on it, and then it loses that tail. If it's uh, going to be a human, it'll lose its tail. And if it's some kind of other animals, it may keep the tail. And so the... This is different. Uh, this is, of course, I believe in German. But uh, what we have here is the, uh, the embryos look different. And the claim is that these are uh, proof that, uh, that they all evolved the same way or that they went through this process. In other words, they started out as like a, uh, uh, a bird started out looking like a fish or looking like a reptile and then turned into a bird. And so this is the claim that was made. And uh, we won't develop it any further, but my counter argument is this. If God created all living organisms, they would have the best system to develop from conception to birth. That would be true if, if there is a God and he created all things and he would use the best system. We have an omniscient being, an omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing being, and he would then use the best system possible to do it. God created all things, that's my claim, and they would, the, the organisms, they would have the best system of development from conception to birth. So whatever the embryo goes through, the fact that the embryos look alike proves nothing because it could be just that these are the best way for that embryo to develop. And so God could have created them that way. So it doesn't necessarily prove that organic macroevolution occurs. The best system might be similar in different in, in, similar in different organisms. That would make perfectly good sense. So again, when we get into chapter six of the logic book, uh, we'll lay this out more thoroughly. Now then, we'll look at some other aspects of science. 
This is Isaac and Michael. This was a book that I used in graduate school, uh, working on my doctorate, uh, learning to do scientific research. But we learned in there, and Isaac and Michael say, science is ultimately concerned with identifying cause and effect relationships. Well, that's true. That's what they're looking at, cause and effect relationships. Since such relationships are always correlated, there's a strong tendency to reverse the process and infer cause and effect status between two or more variables based on an established correlation coefficient. The fact that they correlate doesn't prove there's a cause and effect. The dangerous clear correlation does not necessarily imply causation. This is a, a fallacy that many people uh, commit. Two variables simply may be correlated with the third variable. That's entirely possible. That could be. And that's very clear. If you had my flood course, which is on the internet, YouTube, that flood course, we have in that course, we documented several other logicians and others who say basically the same thing as we have right here with Isaac and Michael. Correlation does not prove cause and effect. It is necessary, but it's not, not necessary. It doesn't prove it. In interpreting correlations, one caution, this is Linton and Gallo, another book that I used in graduate school. One caution is imperative. When you find evidence for the existence of a relationship, you have not found evidence that one factor caused the other. In many cases, both factors are themselves caused by yet a third variable. In general, causative statements are inappropriate in the interpretation of correlation that should be avoided. And that's very important. We could, we could argue that the temperature of the water caused sh shark bites. And we could argue that and uh, we could we could argue then that it causes shark bites of people. Well, if the water is too cold, people don't swim in it, so you don't get much many shark bites. And you see, the temperature of the water might affect it indirectly. That is, it may cause more more people to swim if the water is warmer, and that may make the sharks more active. The warmer water might make them more active. See, there's just too many other variables that come, might come to play. Now, when we go back, if we go back all the way to the embryos, the fact that they correlate doesn't prove cause and effect. So we have to be careful of it. Is homosexuality genetic, we ask? Well, in Simon LeVay in Science 1991 argued that it was, that it's genetic in nature. Scientists have been able to have not been able to replicate the claim by by LeVay. Horgan in Scientific American Volume 273, number five, November 1995, page 26. He argued that there, when they have they tried to replicate his study and they found absolutely no evidence to support it. So what we're running into here is there's no support for his claim and they can't replicate it. One of the things in science, when you perform an experiment and get some certain results, uh, you're supposed to lay out all the details of how you perform that experiment. Other scientists then will try to replicate it, and if they can't replicate it, they figure you're either faking it or there's something different in yours that you didn't record. And some way or some factor in it that made it different. And so here they began to suspect that Simon LeVay was actually faking his data. LeVay's findings have yet to be fully replicated, this is Horgan, by another researcher. As for Hamer, another one uh, that studied this, he studied, he contradicted his results. So we have a, one study that, uh, that contradicted it. Most disturbingly, he has been charged with research improprieties and is now under investigation by the Federal Office of Research Integrity, according to Horgan, page 26. 
So again, uh, we have to be very, very careful about listening to people. Sometimes they have an ax to grind or an agenda. Other scientists claim that it's not genetic. LeVay has been accused of research improprieties we've already seen, and he revisited it and looked at it and claimed that it's not true. All right. The laws of physical science, we look at them, and they have to, they demonstrate that man cannot walk on water. And Archimedes' principle, I would show, would show that we can't walk on water. But Jesus did walk on water. And so we have to argue then, based upon what we know from science, that that's not possible outside the realm of a miraculous event. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came unto them walking upon the sea. So Jesus was walking upon the water upon the sea. We have an obvious miracle and must set aside science to believe the scriptures. So in some instances, we have to set science aside. And the Bible then has to veto Trump or override what the scientist says is possible because this was in the realm of miraculous. We set aside science in this instance to accept the scriptures. Most people do, most believers in the Bible do. Why don't we set aside science in some other instances as well? That's, that's how we need to think regarding these matters, that science is a tentative knowledge, and we need to be aware of it and not let it override or, or, or trump or veto what the Bible says. Scientific evidence never proves anything beyond any all doubt. It shows it to be probable, and in some instances, the probability is so high that we treat it as if it's true. But even then, scientists will admit that there's a possibility there may be situations where it doesn't work. And the scientific law or principle has to be tweaked. And this happened with the law of gravity um, that we find S.R. Isaac Newton, and it was tweaked with Einstein's general theory of relativity. Now, there are some that claim that, uh, that they can use and that they've uh, developed another tweaking of it that uh, actually would preserve I I I Newton's uh, gravitational law with, uh, with, uh, without uh, the relativity. But that's a study for another time in another place. Science usually demonstrates by statistics that something is probably true with different levels of probability. So that's what we're dealing with. So it usually does it with statistics. Dot and Porthero, we're going to look at science now. And uh, and I have this uh, this site in in your bibliography. Uh, they state during the 1950s. This is quite some time ago. I was in elementary and high school. I started uh, elementary school in 1949. Biochemists developed a theory for the origin of life that has had a profound influence on geologic thinking ever since. So you see, biochemists influence geology. How? Well, he's going to show you here. That theory required an oxygen-free or anaerobic ocean and atmosphere. So we had to start out without any free oxygen in the atmosphere in order for the organic evolution to occur according to their theory of how it occurred. A macroevolution I'm talking about, of course. Uh, limited experimental results seem to confirm the inference that complex protein molecules could not have formed if free molecular oxygen, O2, existed at the Earth's surface. Naturally, the biochemists then ask if the geologic record supported this apparent requirement. So then, so they ask the geologist, does that support the requirement? We can't have oxygen, free oxygen. 
John just quickly asserted that yes, indeed, RK inlets, old, old rocks, bear evidence of anaerobic, that's anaerobic means that there's no oxygen, anaerobic early conditions. Both chemists and geologists did hypothesize how our present oxygen risks or anaerobic uh, or aerobic atmosphere, that, that aerobic means it's got a free oxygen in it, might have developed slowly. Geologic evidence cited by RK and our anaerobic conditions may not stand up well in critical scrutiny. I'm, I've underlined this, and it wasn't underlined in the original house, I added the underlining. And hindsight suggests that perhaps geologists found what the biochemists wanted. They're all a bunch of atheists, and they're going to they're going to support each other with argumentation and claim that that it was true. But hindsight suggests this this fellow agrees that they perhaps found what the biochemist wanted, and that's what the geologist found. So you can tweak the data if you're not careful. A number of similar instances of dishonor by scientists can be cited from scientific literature. Now, those that I cited a whole series of them in my flood course, in my flood book, and I have them documented uh, in the journals. These are reputable scientific journals, not, not those that are written by members of the church or Christians, but these are written by scientific journals. Uh, very reputable journals, and they admit that there's been impropriety among scientists. Uh, so we have dishonesty. This is not a quote of a theist, but a quote from atheists. Keep that in mind. I've included a number of similar quotes in my book, The Study of the Biblical Flood. I think all of you have that book. And let's go to the study of history. The standard claim of the Communist Party is that Jesus of Nazareth never existed. He's a fictitious person. That's the claim that he's fictitious. But there's an abundance of historical evidence that he existed. So now you, you have to learn how historians uh, prove that something was historically true. And so we, we're, we have to delve into that area. So when we're dealing with all kinds of people, we have to get on their ground and uh, take, usually what we have to do is take their own material and use it against them. Because the, the Bible is clear that Jesus really truly existed. I believe there's abundant historical evidence that he existed and using historical research techniques can prove it. The evidence is overwhelming that it was not only that it existed, but that he was crucified, was buried, and rose on the third day. I've developed this point and other lessons under the heading of apologetics. So now after we've studied logic, I propose to have two more courses. The follow-up courses, and that would be, we're going to look at claims that the Bible has errors in it, alleged contradictions in the Bible will uh, logically be able to evaluate those claims. Then I want to also uh, develop what's called apologetics, showing that indeed God exists and the scriptures are his word. And now, let's look at history. This whole line of reasoning is summed up in the following expression. Absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. I doubt that any of you could tell me the name of my great grandfather who fought in the Civil War in the United States. And I, I, you probably wouldn't even have any idea what his name was. And uh, yet I did have one. So the fact that you don't know his name doesn't prove he didn't, that he didn't exist. That doesn't prove it. Uh, ignorance of absence of evidence or ignorance of evidence is not the same as the absence of evidence. People can see this line of reasoning that's unsound. And so, but that's part of the reasoning of, of some, some people with regard to some historical information. Even if I cannot name your maternal great grandfather, my ignorance of his name doesn't prove he never existed. Now we understand that. 
That's pretty clear. I probably couldn't name any of you's great maternal great grandfather. Uh, my maternal great grandfather fought in the Civil War, and uh, so he was uh, in the Union Army as an officer in the Union Army, was wounded, right? But he was my maternal great grandfather, right? The whole line of reasoning of the atheist is summed up the following invalid hypothetical syllogism. If there's evidence that blank occurred, then blank occurred. Well, that's axiomatic. That's, that's self-evident truth. If there's evidence, then it occurred. And then they say there's no evidence that it occurred, therefore it didn't occur. Well, if there's evidence that your great-grandfather lived, uh, then he lived. There's no evidence that he lived. I don't know his name. And so I don't have any evidence that he lived. So you didn't have a great grandfather. So look how foolish that is. It's, it's really foolish, the thinking of some people. And of course, when we get into chapter six of the logic book, we'll show this is a logical fallacy. We'll show it by several illustrations. Right? The argument contains the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Here's an illustration of that fallacy, and we need to understand this fallacy. If Joe is a citizen of Iowa, then Joe is a, citizen, a U.S. citizen. Well, that's certainly true. That state, this statement is true. All Iowa citizens are also U.S. citizens. Joe is not a citizen of Iowa. I suspect that every one of you knows a person named Joe. That's a pretty common name. And you may know a Joe that's not a citizen of Iowa, but is a US citizen. See how silly it is? Now, what we've done is this term here, Joe is a citizen of Iowa, is the anti, A-N-T-E, it's Latin for before antecedent. And then the consequent is the words after the word then, right? So you deny the antecedent, and that doesn't prove a cotton-picking thing about the consequent. Now, if we deny the consequent, then we prove, if I prove that Joe's not a U.S. citizen, then I prove he's not a citizen of Iowa. Now, that's true. We can deny the consequent, and that'll falsify the antecedent. But you can't deny the antecedent and falsify the consequent. And you can't say he's not a, not a U.S. citizen. Yes, there are people named Joe who are not U.S. citizens. I have no doubt about that. I'm certain that there'll be some people in England named Joe and some people in, in Canada and Australia and New Zealand probably named Joe. And they're not U.S. citizens. Yeah, but their name is Joe. I chose the name Joe because it's short, it's three letters, and it's a very common name. So it illustrates my point here. This is a simple one. We can see it and without having to know all the rules of logic. When in chapter six of the logic course, we'll show that it's a fallacy and we'll remember it as a fallacy. Let me lay this out now, summarize it. In psychology and psychiatry, we see the folly of following science is when they contradict the scriptures and, and they change and they'll, they'll decide they've been wrong and they'll have to change. Well, that's the nature of science. We think something is working a certain way and we find out it's not. And so we have to make some changes in it. Changes have to be made from time to time. Two examples from biological science were introduced to demonstrate the folly of following the branch of science thought of as biology when it contradicts the scriptures. And so we see the, the fall fallacy or folly of following it. We looked at two examples from physical science were set forth to demonstrate the folly of following the branch of science, physical science, when it contradicts the scriptures again. Again. Both the existence and resurrection of Jesus were set forth as examples from history of the following, following the discipline, this discipline, history, history, when it contradicts the scriptures. So we need to be very careful when we are doing and looking at this information. Now, we are pretty much 
to the point now we're going to start getting into passages of scripture, seeing how we interpret them. What we've laid out here now is this. We're not going to let science or mathematics even, or even logic, we're not going to let that contradict the Bible because faith is something we know for certain. And that's, that's the difference. Otherwise, because we've already shown that the other methods of knowing things are only tentative and we can't be certain about them. So I would argue that faith is superior to the other ways of knowing things. And we start with that premise and we'll, we'll go into that in the next week. Now, are there any questions that anyone has? Okay.